Hi guys, Jonathan Ferguson here again with a real corker this time. A pair of them actually. Let's show you this one first. I have to be very careful with this leather. Let's let the autofocus catch up. There we go. So a iron plate, probably iron rather than steel, but I'm not sure. With a percussion lock mechanism screwed to it, little short chimney like barrel there, and a weird trigger for, for a cord. And the cord then runs through a little loop on a leather belt around to the front because this sits in the small of your back. Um, show you the rest of the belt quickly. And then, so that's the version that we have photographed, and that's one of two main types of these that exist. It's the same pattern that we have on display in our self-defense gallery, when you come back and see us, hopefully soon, um, you can get a good look at that in its case. So we have two of those. However, neither of those are the actual Henry Ball patent belt pistol. Henry Ball was a Birmingham gun maker, uh, active from 1849 to 1868-ish. And his actual patent with the drawing depicts this. This came in a, a lovely lacquered tin, as you can see. Um, I've even seen a version with printed instructions, which, which are amazing. I'm really sad that we don't have those. but. I'm not sad that we have this because it's amazing. The same basic idea, let me get it out of its tin. Carefully. So, same idea, much thinner steel, steel almost certainly, plate with a longer barrel, potentially therefore more effective. Because I've always thought about these belt pistols that they would be remarkably low velocity. There's the lock mechanism, there's the barrel, there's the lug on the side of the barrel for turning it off. This is a proper turn off barrel and a stamp that says H Balls Patent. So the other two that we have are unmarked. This one is actually claimed by Henry Ball himself and it's of the same exact design as the patent. You can see the cord running from the, the trigger below there into a special sleeve that then would have originally run round to the front and to which was once attached this wooden toggle, just like a light pull, flat on one side because it would sit on your belt in place um, pulled taut while, when the gun's cocked and then you, if you're set upon from behind the gun is obviously pre-loaded with powder and bullet pre-cocked dicey but that's how it works and then you reach surreptitiously down to your belt and pull the cord and it would shoot the attacker who knows where it depends how tall they are doesn't really bear thinking about so they're the objects. Carefully put that one down. Um, and now let, now let me explain why the heck this exists. So for a long time I assumed that these were novelty items. I was aware of some of the history behind them. Um, there is an excellent book on this subject that I recommend called Masculinity, Crime and Self-Defense in Victorian Literature. That's by Emmeline Godfrey, who is a, a very helpful uh, contact of ours, and we've corresponded on these before. She sh shows the patent drawing from Henry Ball, dated 1858, for the second version that I showed you. There's no suggestion that he went on and changed that design, or that there was an earlier, cruder version. I am as sure as I can be that the chunky version is a knockoff. Um, 
which said, tells us something about how popular these must have been. There's no, no recorded history of their use, but then I'm not sure that there would be. Um, it's quite possible people walked around wearing these without ever having needed to use them because they were a response to a moral panic that kicked off in the 1850s, 1855 until the early 1860s in the UK uh, uh, to do with violent criminals, garroting people. Now, not necessarily with a, with a cord or a wire, as we think of today, and, all, and not, for the most part, intending to kill. This was a robbery technique. So two or three guys would um, stalk a victim, and they would even use a prostitute to lure them down a, a, a lane, that, that was called a, a dark lurk, according to one criminal that was interviewed. Um, and then the, the most skilled or, and or biggest of them would grab you from behind and they might use a handkerchief or something across the throat, they might use a cane or a stick, or they might very well just put you in uh, what we would now call, um, I, I can't do it, <laughs> a rear naked choke or a sleeper hold from wrestling. Um, in fact, a couple of decades later, the sleeper hold was uh, a popular move in wrestling. I'm not sure that there's a direct connection, but same idea. And the idea was to put the, incapacitate the victim uh, so that they couldn't get away, so that they couldn't cry out, and you could take your time robbing them of whatever valuables they had on them. Now, this was almost certainly blown out of proportion in terms of how many actual crimes of this nature went on. Uh, robbery, of course, very common, armed robbery, um, even. Um, but the actual garrotting technique, unclear as to how popular that really was. But it was a genuine fear of the sort of middle and upper middle classes that if they were out walking, um, they might be garrotted. Two main groups were feared for this. Uh, one were sort of just violent criminals who, who got out of prison early on an early form of parole. Um, known as a ticket of leave, which came in around this, just before this time, funnily enough, and was sort of decried in the press as, um, you know, being soft on criminals. Um, and of course, if the criminals were permanently locked away, they weren't going to hurt anyone. But this was an attempt to sort of uh, reform a rather problematic prison system. So the usual tension in society between trying to rehabilitate versus letting potentially violent people out. I won't go any further into that debate. The other group that were feared to do this, and that this pistol might protect you against, were the thugs. Um, thug deriving from an Indian word, um, meaning trickster, essentially. And allegedly in the earlier phase of this, in 1853, well, in fact, sorry, even earlier than that, 1830s and 40s, there was fear in British India of the same thing only this was supposed to be the cult of Kali um, and they would kill you before they robbed you. Uh, so there was some fear back in the UK later on when this had become a, a scare that the person robbing you might be a thug from India who was going to kill you, not just lift your pocket watch or whatever. Now that's um, even less, I don't think there are any accounts of followers of thuggy um, actually doing this in the UK. If you were going to get garroted, it was probably by a violent criminal um, who'd learnt the technique. But it seems to have been overblown even in that case. But a really fascinating piece of social history and um, cha cha a fascinating chapter in the history of self-defence. Because whatever the actual risk of getting set upon in this way, People genuinely thought that this was a problem. Um, there were other ways to defend yourself. Um, Emmeline's book has, a, has a, a depiction, a photograph and a depiction of a leather collar or stock studded with spikes. So that if said um, thug or, or criminal tried to put you in a hold, his arm would end up spiked and he would not be happy. Um, or if he used a stick or something, it wouldn't work because you effectively armoured around the neck. I've often wondered why um, people in zombie movies don't wear some sort of neck protection like that. Anyway, that's a tangent. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for watching. I hope you found that as interesting as I did. Uh, really fascinating to 
actually look in detail at a genuine Henry Ball uh, pistol. By the way, that one's been refinished and has pitting, showing that it has actually been loaded and used at one time. So, who knows? Um, and to compare it with what we think are the knockoffs, but all from the same time, 1850s, 60s, amazing bit of Victorian history. We will have links in the description for ways in which you can support the museum. Uh, not long now until you can come and see us. Uh, 19th of May here in Leeds. Uh, Fort Nelson is already open outdoors. Please do come and see us. You can come to our self-defence gallery, learn all about the history of self-defence from pretty much the year dot, or at least um, where arms and armour are involved. And we look forward to seeing you.